come to our fourth Center Point Holy Week reflection. Uh, remember to get the most out of this video. You should also head to our website, centerpointchurch.ca, and download our reflection guide. Gather around with your family, watch the video, and then talk together about what uh, about what's been discussed in this video. Now, I don't know if you knew this, but today is a very important day. Because tonight, as the sun goes down, Jewish people from around the world will gather together to celebrate Passover. Now, because Passover is tied to a lunar calendar, it, it tends to move around throughout the week. And this year, Passover is celebrated from sundown tonight until sundown Thursday. Now, the Passover plays a significant role in the Jewish faith. Because Passover celebrated all that God did to rescue the Israelite people from slavery in Egypt. Now, the events of the Passover can be uh, found in the book of Exodus, and especially chapters 11 to 12. And really, the whole book of Exodus is about God's mighty hand rescuing the people of Israel from slavery in Egypt. And the first 10 chapters of that book of Exodus tells us about Moses, about his early life, about his call by God to go and be that deliverer. Uh, and it tells about the first nine plagues, uh, plague after pl devastating plague that God sent against Egypt and against Pharaoh in order to get Pharaoh to release God's people. But Pharaoh kept resisting. Pharaoh would not acknowledge God's authority or God's uh, request to let his people go. He just kept saying, no, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to let my workforce go. I will not bow before this God who's telling me to listen. I'm not going to do it. Now, finally, God said there would be one more plague, the death of all the firstborn. Now, this is a terrible plague. It's shocking to think about. In my family, if the firstborn were to die, I would die. Jen would die. Jordan would die. Uh, at home, there would just be our three little ones. And, and this happened all over Egypt. And if, if I were in Pharaoh's shoes, if, if someone who had demonstrated such incredible power nine previous times, if he came to me and said, hey, you better let these people go or else. I, I mean, I hope that I would have said, all right, please stop, just get out of here. But Pharaoh thought that he was God. He thought that he was God's equal. His whole religion was based on the fact that the Pharaoh and the Pharaoh's son uh, was God, descended from the gods. And so who was he to listen to the God of the Israelites? Who was he to bow before Yahweh? And so he refused. He refused to let the people go. And so God told Moses that on midnight of a certain night, he would pass through Egypt and strike down the firstborn of all of Egypt from Pharaoh's firstborn son all the way down to the lowliest servant girl in Egypt. And there would be a wailing in Egypt such as has never been heard before. But God wanted to make a distinction between the Egyptians and the Israelites. And so he provided a way for the Israelites to be protected. Each Israelite family was to take a young lamb. They were to sacrifice that young lamb at twilight, and they were to use a, a hyssop branch to paint the doorposts and the lintels, the frame, uh, all around their home with the blood of the lamb. They were to roast that lamb uh, over a fire. They were to eat that meal. They were to bake uh, simple cakes made without yeast, a little like a light bread. Uh, and basically, they were supposed to eat dressed ready to go. Because God said that next morning they were going to be leaving. And so he told them to pack their bags. He told them to sleep that night as though they were leaving the next day. Be ready. Have your bags packed. You are about to be thrust out of Egypt. And so that's what the Israelites did. They sacrificed those lambs. They painted the, the doorposts and the lintels of their homes with the blood. And as the angel of God passed through the land of Egypt, when he saw the blood, he would pass over that house and he wouldn't strike down anyone within it. This is the meal that Jesus is, was celebrating, and this is the meal uh, that is being celebrated tonight. Tonight, all over the world, Jewish families are gathering together around the unleavened bread. They're gathering to eat the bitter herbs. They're gathering to remember the suffering of Egypt and to recall again God's incredible saving power, triumphing over the God of the Egyptians, bringing his people out of slavery in Egypt, and protecting them by the blood of the Lamb. Now for Christians, this meal is also significant, 
And it's significant because it was this Passover meal that Jesus was eating with his disciples on the night that he was betrayed. Now, for the disciples, they celebrated Passover many times. They probably even celebrated the meal in years past with Jesus. And as I picture Passover, uh, to be perfectly honest, I've been around holidays for 36 years. And, and so often what happens in my life with a holiday is once there was a seriousness, once there was a somberness, but over time, you're getting together with family, you're eating meals, you're laughing, and, and some of the... Uh, some of the seriousness can fade away a little bit. I mean, Thanksgiving, for me, growing up, that was that was playing football. Uh, Christmas, growing up for me, that was playing road hockey. It was eating these big meals. It was having fun with families. It was opening gifts. And yes, there was also serious moments. I mean, Christmas is all about our sin is so great that God needed to send a rescuer, a redeemer for us, God with us. Thanksgiving is a time to look back on all that God has given us and to say thanks. But it's also a time of celebration. It's a time of fun. And so there's a part of me that thinks that these disciples were in a very different mood than Jesus. They were probably ready for the, the Passover joy, that celebration time. Man, remember when God kicked Egyptian butt. But Jesus was celebrating this meal in a very different way. This time, as Jesus sat down to eat the meal with them, the tone was very different. First, John tells us that before the meal even began, Jesus washed his disciples' feet. He told them that uh, even as the leader, they were actually a little bit embarrassed that he was doing it, but that he'd come to be a servant and he'd come to serve them even by washing their feet. And then as Jesus led the disciples through the Passover celebration, he took the familiar elements, the bread and the cup, and he applied them in new and completely unexpected ways. See, first Jesus picked up the bread. Now, the bread that Jesus took and broke was unleavened bread. It was bread made without yeast. And it was made this way because Israelite people were leaving in a hurry. They didn't have time to make bread that would rise. They, they simply mixed together flour, salt, water, baked the flat bread. And, and that was the bread that they were eating. And as God taught the rescued Israelite people to celebrate Passover in Deuteronomy 16, he told them that for the week of Passover, uh, they were to get rid of the yeast in their lives. They were actually to go through their homes and clean it and get rid of every trace of yeast. Uh, and it's because the yeast, which makes bread rise, it became associated with sin and sin's effects. And the thing is, it doesn't take very much yeast for a loaf of bread to rise. And so the unleavened bread reminded the people of their need to live holy lives. It reminded the Israelite people of their need to sanctify themselves, to purify themselves, to prepare. But Jesus took that unleavened bread and he said that it was his body. Think about that. This is unleavened bread. There's no yeast in it. And Jesus was saying this was his body, his perfect, spotless, sinless body. Broken for them. And then after eating the bread, Jesus took the cup. Now, the cup represented redemption. Uh, the cup that Jesus drank from was the cup which was usually which was usually introduced with the promise of Exodus 6:6. 6, 6. Exodus 6:6 6, 6 says, "I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments." But instead of saying that, Jesus said, "This cup is the new covenant between God and his people." An agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. And 21 hours later, Jesus was on a cross, redeeming us with outstretched arms, arms nailed to the cross, and redeeming us with great judgment, but it was judgment that was poured out on Jesus for our sin. Friends, Jesus completely reinterpreted the Passover meal. He said, once there was this great salvation act when I led the people of Israel out of Egypt, but now I am doing a new saving act with my body, with my blood. I am the Passover lamb and I am redeeming a new people. I am redeeming all people. I am dying for their sins. My body broken, my blood shed. Now, Paul, reflecting on these truths a number of years later and, and writing to a church that was mixed, mired in sin and depravity, he wrote in 1 Corinthians 5, 6 to 8. 
he, they, they were a church that was really messed up. They, they were boasting about their sin. And Paul says to them, your boasting about this is terrible. Don't you realize that this sin is like a little yeast that spreads through the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast by removing the wicked person from among you. Then you will be like a fresh batch of dough made without yeast, which is what you really are. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us. So let us celebrate the festival, not with the old bread of wickedness and evil, but with the new bread of sincerity and truth. In the New Testament, the church at Corinth uh, is kind of the poster child for dysfunction. They had eagerly embraced the message of Jesus, but rather than allowing it to transform their lives, uh, they used the things of God to continue to practice their sinful actions. See, first they heard that Jesus forgave sin, and they were excited by that, but they were also excited by the fact that the forgiver would continually forgive their sins. And so they engaged in some outrageously sinful behavior. They heard that Jesus gave spiritual gifts to his church, and they were so excited, they actually received and used spiritual gifts. But then they began to elevate one another um, over who had what gift, and they began to look down on those that didn't have the best gifts. And they began to use their selfishness to just kind of, kind of run roughshod over one another. And then they heard about communion. They heard about the bread and the cup. They learned how Christians would celebrate communion by eating full meals together. But the rich in Corinth, they didn't celebrate communion with a little bread and a little cup. They celebrated it by having wild parties beginning early in the day. And so by the time the poor laborers would come and join church, the rich people were already drunk in a corner. I mean, that was how they were celebrating communion, by eating and eating and eating and getting drunk. Now, Paul had to write the letters to the church in Corinth uh, because their attitudes about these things were all wrong. Their, their tolerance was backward. They weren't living according to their new identity. They were still living their old lives. They had just pasted Jesus over certain areas. They changed some names. They changed uh, some actions, but mostly they were living their old lives in the name of Jesus. So Paul has to get harsh. He has to tell them that they even need to kick out an unrepenting uh, believer because of his actions and attitudes. They have to get rid of him. They have to kick him out of the fellowship. Now, this seems really harsh. But for Paul, this man and his actions and the pride and the boasting of the Corinthian church about this man, it was full of yeast. It was full of the kingdom of darkness. And the church was not living as the church that Christ had died for. And so Paul says, because Jesus, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed, we have to live as Passover people. We are to live as people who deal with the yeast in our lives, who allow God to transform us to live lives of sincerity and truth. We are already that new dough. That's what Paul says. We just have to live like it. So later in 1 Corinthians 11, as Paul continues to correct and rebuke and correct and rebuke this church, in 1 Corinthians 11, he goes to talk about communion, and he goes back to Christ's words at the Last Supper. And he calls the Corinthian church back to the basics. This is what Jesus said, his body broken for you, his blood shed for you. But then he said, okay, guys, this is Christ's body and blood. Are we drinking it in an unworthy manner? He said we're to examine ourselves before we sit down to eat. He reminded them that communion is not a chance to get drunk. It's an invitation to eat and drink and remember the sacrifice of Jesus for us. Friends, we'll be celebrating communion on Friday as we gather together to watch our Good Friday reflection at 10.30 a.m. And I want to leave you with the same challenge that Paul gave to the church in Corinth. Jesus, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Uh, we are a new creation. We are new Passover bread. We're the new dough. But are we living like that? Or are we still living our old lives full of wickedness and evil? What kind of people are we going to be? Are we going to be like the Corinthian church? Or are we going to be a people who deal with the yeast, the sin in our lives, so that we can celebrate with sincerity and truth? Now, the process of sanctification, Jesus making us holy, it's not easy, but the promise in all of this is that we're not doing it ourselves. We're not alone. Nathan doesn't have to work to try to make Nathan holy. 
Instead, Jesus is the one who's making me holy. And what he requires is first honesty. I have to be real with him about my need for cleansing. And second, I have to choose to agree and repent as he shows me the things in my life that are displeasing, as he shows me that yeast that I've been clinging to that he wants to clear out. And so friends, as we get ready for Good Friday and Easter Sunday, I encourage you, take some time to prepare your heart. Take some time to be still before the Lord and invite him to examine you. And if there are things he wants to deal with, confess them and repent of them. Friends, we are that new dough. Let us live lives of sincerity and truth. Let me pray for you and then I'll let you get on to your reflection. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the hard work that you have already done. You are the Passover lamb. Your blood has been sacrificed for us. And because of your blood, the punishment for sin passes over us. Uh, when you look at us, you don't see our sin. You see the righteousness, the holiness of Jesus. We are justified. Uh, we are being sanctified and we will be glorified. Father, we thank you for these incredible truths. But God, as we prepare for Good Friday and as we prepare for Easter, we don't want to make light of your sacrifice. You have made us to be a new dough. You have made us to live a life of holiness and you desire holiness for us. And so God, we don't want to be people who just pretend, who live our old lives, but carry around uh, the banner of Jesus sometimes. We want to be real Jesus followers, real Jesus people. We want your presence and your power to impact every area of our lives. And so Jesus, would you make us holy? Jesus, would you show us the yeast that's in our lives? And would you prepare us this year for an incredible Good Friday and Easter service, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.